You're listening to a Thames Estuary Partnership podcast celebrating London's famous tidal river. We hope you enjoy it. Hello and a big warm welcome back to Talk of the Thames. I'm your host Chloe Russell and on today's episode I'll be chatting with Giles Tofield from The Cultural Engine. The Cultural Engine offers expert and friendly support for organisations making a difference in their communities and improving local economies. Giles sheds light into what projects they have worked on and what the future looks like for them. We also find out about the North Thames Fisheries Local Action Group, it's always a mouthful that one, and how TEP was involved in the programme successes. I hope you enjoyed the show. Welcome, we've got Giles Tofield here, a big warm welcome. How are you Giles? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, very well. Excellent. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming. No, thanks for inviting me. So it's right that you work at Cultural Engine. That's right. Yeah, it's definitely. That's a um, small community interest company based in Rochford these days. Um, started off in partnership with South End Council back in 2013. Mm. And um, there's, there's two directors, me and my colleague Peter Vadden. And we basically work across the cultural um, heritage and sort of wider regeneration and community development sectors, local authorities, charities, specialising in sort of project development, getting funding, and supporting people to sort of progress their their ideas that are basically good for good for society, good for communities and good for local economies. That's kind of what we're interested in really and that's what we've been doing. I hope to some tangible success over the years. That's always good. <laughs> well particularly focused on South Essex, but increasingly sort of wider Essex and, and into the east of England and occasionally beyond as well. But we're really focused on sort of the area around South Essex, I suppose, that's where we started, South End, Rochford, that sort of area. Um, and um, we sort of bring our knowledge, hopefully, back to benefit those areas particularly. Amazing. So it's you and your colleague, Peter, the director. Peter Vadden, yeah. So what do you, do you have the same skill sets or do you have strengths and weaknesses in different areas? Like how do you work together on projects? That's an interesting question i think we, think we definitely have different skill sets peter is a sort of trained accounting technician he's had lots of years he was 27 years in south end council cultural services and, and other roles okay. internal audit and so on wow. i think that's a good thing and he he's fantastic at sort of finances business planning issues around accounting governance setting up companies with people does a lot of that particularly project management particularly large large heritage projects using heritage funding or other lottery mm-hmm. funds that kind of thing and I tend to be more, more of the sort of uh, the writing strategy type person doing the talks and presentations doing lots of the writing the bids all that sort of stuff and um sort of on the ground with with communities and sort of you know beyond just our core work often together I can rely upon him for all that sort of good stuff governance <laughs> everything else finances getting things right um that matter running the running the company making sure returns are all done all those sort of things and i um, can sort of initiate silly ideas and projects all over the place and and make sure he's got my back when um when i need it i love that i love silly ideas so it sounds like you are the creative brain in this duo well, I definitely wouldn't say that because Peter's got many years of experience and lots of creativity as well. But I suppose if there was a, yeah, I mean, you know, we have different roles and uh, I'm less, less, put it this way, I'm less inclined to do that sort of stuff. <laughs> but he, he's good at it and thank God that he's there. Um, but, so, but in terms of a team, yeah, I mean, if, 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 if organisations or local charities, which they often do, come to us for the bit of support initially, of course, we don't always charge for things because we're, um, you know, we're there to support people. We can have we can give a rounded view of their organisation where they are, their 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 opportunities, their their, their governance, you know, um, their um, sort of ideas for new projects. Think about a whole range of things together, and we've got many of the bases covered in that respect. And it helps get people, you know, started on their journey to doing something a bit, you know, more sustainable, different. However, the organisation wants to go. So we worked very well together in that respect. We must do because it's almost 10 years now that we've been together on it. He came from South End Council. We started it while he was at South End Council. They gave him a day a week to get the cultural engine going. It was initially intended to be a sort of a, a cultural development um, support for organisations in South End, primarily, recognising that sort of post-2010 and the financial crash and everything, that finances were, were tight, although they look even tighter today. 
Mm. Um, and um, and that the sort of support the local authority there, or, or the local authority there, and and I suppose other local authorities and other sort of systems that are in place, they weren't necessarily able to provide that level of support anymore because um, you know, sort of classic arts development, cultural development offices had largely disappeared. That's where it came from, and we did a lot of that. I mean, worked with communities and local charities and South Essex homes and people like that initially to get things going, and. Um, and uh, we, we sort of got established and um, had space in the old Beecroft um, Art Gallery building in South End um, for quite a few years. And we moved to Rochford in 2021, I think, yeah, during COVID. We um, ran a sort of future gazing project funded by the lottery in 2020, looking at post-COVID future market towns um, wow. and in a, in, in a context of sort of globalisation and changing to, you know, local economies and all that sort of stuff and what should be one of the places we were looking at so we thought well we'll go there and mm-hmm. contribute our efforts to develop uh, Rochford and surrounding areas so as well as the wider um, sort of Essex location too but that's why we moved so we've got a, a little set up there and we work with a few other people there as well who have experience of other things like festivals and wow. events and um, and all those sort of things so we've got a sort of expanding team but there's still only two core directors but we have other people that we work with too. Mm-hmm. Sounds really diverse the projects you're working on. Well, that's kind of the problem, I suppose, is that they are very diverse. Yeah, I mean, they could all be they could all be, um, I suppose, summarised as, as community focused, local economic mm. development. You know, concepts like community wealth building and local economies and all that sort of stuff come often come to the fore in our work, um, and um, we're interested in the difference people can make in their in, in their communities. Because if, if you're a creative person and you're or you're an artist or you're um, you know, you, you're involved in some sort of local committee project supporting people or trying to sort of improve your area. Um, you don't necessarily want to be um, writing funding applications or doing strategy, getting on with stuff. Um, or you may not, it may not be your, your skill set, and often it isn't. So having people that can work behind the scenes, I mean, we call ourselves a cultural engine because you don't see the engine in the car. It's sort of behind the, you know, sort of working your way in, un, underneath the bonnet. And, oh, and I love other, that. And other people can get the credit and do what they need to do. We can work behind the scenes to support them. Wow, I love that. So going back to all these wonderful projects, have you, can you tell us a little bit about maybe some of your favourite projects you've worked on in the past? What would you, have you got any highlights in the last 10 years? I mean, We've done, we've, you know, we've done a, f- a fair few um, across different sectors. I mean, in terms of um, heritage, you know, for example, one of the first projects got started was at Bordsy Radar in Suffolk. Peter got a contract there to be project manager for the uh, first operational radar station, and, which is in quite a remote location opposite Felixstowe Ferry. We both worked on it from more or less the beginning. It used to be sort of quite a sort of old, fairly run down concrete building. Um, with a temporary exhibition open a few times a year with a very dedicated local team to what is now a sort of um, fairly significant heritage centre, fully kitted out with modern interpretation. Wow. And, um, a, um, members of staff and everything, and we supported Peter primarily, but you know, but that was the sort of um, formative project for us in many ways. We did a lot of work with South Essex Homes um, in the early days looking at projects to support or, or to help people be more proactive in, so, in terms of social housing in the South End area around certain issues one being digital creating a setup of different spaces called digital hubs where people with some skills can support other people free of charge and get training to do that kind of thing often working with creatives to sort of get them involved as well um, and we also did something called the south End food culture project which was a big study of food culture as opposed to health around food focused on south end and what you know communities and south Essex homes others could do to sort of stimulate an interest in food culture more broadly with health health outcomes but ultimately not focusing on that sort of side of things we did a lot of work and consultation engagement with people on that was quite interesting and then um you know more recently we obviously we're going to talk a little bit about the north thames fisheries local action group but one of the sort of most productive things we, we did was work on the Coastal Community Team Initiative, Government Initiative, start 2015, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail in due course. But that had mm-hmm. quite a tangible effect and was able to um, enable us to write some local economic plans for certain areas, um, Shoebury mm-hmm. and, um, and up on the Deben Peninsula in Suffolk, bringing different stakeholders together and sort of really producing some results in terms of projects and funding and outcomes. So there's a few sort of little sort of you know, instances of some success, I suppose. I mean, I'm yeah. also, um, you know, this. I mean, there's just there's just so many different things. I mean, uh, 
the moment we're working in Uttlesford, which is nowhere near the Thames, <laughs> um, around Saffron Morden Way, Great Demo, Thaxted, those sort of areas on a cultural oh, yeah. strategy, which is fantastic, really different sort of area in northwest Essex, really making some uh, some progress, I think, in pulling different sort of key strategic arts and cultural organisations together in an area that's going to see significant growth, which is currently is like 96% rural and agricultural and quite wealthy, which is a different challenge because normally when working in places that you make a clear economic argument based on sort of a range of sort of indicators showing relative deprivation, challenging economic circumstances, but Uthelsford is not really like that. So it's been an interesting one for us. And um, yeah, that's a sort of another side to it. But also the work over the years of Essex Cultural Diversity Project, I got involved in around 2016 as they were going through their um, – uplift program funded by the arts council for emerging organizations that were wanting to be um, national portfolio organizations of the arts council did a lot of the work evaluation of the program and eventually wrote the uh, the first application for mpo status in 2018 and they've been key sort of organization kind of a bit like us really growing across the region progressively um mm-hmm. over that time i've been working in the background on the strategy and the, and the development of projects and concepts and funding and everything else hopefully securing another three years funding um from 23 24 so having a big impact giving people a chance to to develop their careers in the arts and uh, sort of focusing on diversity really across the cultural sectors in in the east and i think there's been some some quite significant impacts from from that work as well again kind of behind the scenes you know i don't sit at the front um sometimes i do the presentations but my colleague indy sandu is the sort of front of house if you like and he's been leading it since 2008 so we've made a significant difference together since um since since we started work you know about sort of um six seven years ago what were you doing before like what was the light bulb moment to think okay this is what i want to be doing now and this is the route i want to be taking um i mean back um I mean, it, my degree was nothing to do with communities or economic development. Thing it was obviously it, I I did um, literature and criticism and critical theory for masters, I love that. and um, that's so nice. I started a PhD in philosophy, but I didn't finish it. That's another story. But um, that's so cool. <laughs> I always had an interest in that, sort of that side of things. But um, but I was I was living and working um, in Greenwich um, or around Greenwich at the time of the millennium, and quite mm. easy to get jobs at Greenwich Council at that time. Unsurprisingly, given the number. A number amount of investment going in, and even down and everything else, and it got me into sort of economic development and regeneration um, programs, and I got quite interested in it. And um, I, I then went to work um, for the private sector, a company called Rocket Science, and then in, uh, for Lewisham Council, and then um, Basildon Council, Basildon Renaissance, and in the regeneration team there. And then ultimately became head of regeneration at South End, at the region at um, Renaissance South End, the urban regeneration company there from 2006 to 2011. But I was always drawn to sort of the cultural and creative side of things, particularly mm. and and the sort of the local impact that they can make and heritage on local economies, on sense of place, everything else, because of my background and interest in, in the arts, I suppose. So I was always drawn to working with people on those kind of things and less drawn to what you might call the larger regeneration projects, you know, massive bulldozing projects, massive developments, you know, working with supermarkets, those sort of things. Right. I wasn't really interested in that so much. No. I often thought, well, we'll be back here in 20 years' time regenerating those. Finer grain um, projects, um, working with communities, that's what interested me in the role of the creative industries and cultural sectors and heritage projects and organisations really interested me in their role, um, you know, Broadly, and you know, offering people like chances to take part, volunteering, place making, everything else, tourism, mm. you know, that interested me. So, the government changed 2010, obviously. Um, they kind of announced a bonfire of quangos and all that sort of stuff. Um, and um, the urban regen- regeneration companies, which were separate from local authorities, had a sort of um, were, you know, were independent from, from government too, but funded through government and the regions. Um, they got rid of the East of England Development Agency. Um, they got rid of the urban regeneration companies and all the sort of funding streams around Thames Gateway that we were working through at the time. Mm. Um, but I worked on some major schemes um, there, including um, you know major public realm programs in South End, including one along the Thames, what's called the City Beach area, where we transformed you know the Golden Mile effectively um, in mm. South End, made it more appealing, public realm and everything else, new lighting and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so I'd, I'd done a lot of that, but obviously had to become a um, work outside in 2011 when finally it shut down 
and uh, I worked on a city of culture bid for South End um, in 2012 as a sort of consultant because of my previous role in doing that sort of thing. Um, then started working for a, lo- a local education trust where, again, a lot of cultural projects were funded because they were outside the school system. They could fund school programs and we did a lot of funding and work um, on arts council projects with them. Wow. But the whole time, ever since leaving Western stuff, then people were always saying, oh, can you help me with, with this funding? Can you get involved in this? And I was like, well, you know, I can, but I've not really got the time, you know, because I'm doing this, all this other stuff. And just a meeting with Peter, we just met outside South and Victoria Station as he was coming back from lunch and I was going out and we said, well, you should do something, you know, I'm a bit, you know, I'm really keen to sort of push out. I could see the need in the South End and we decided to set a company up, persuaded the council to back it and then focus more or less entirely on culture and heritage wow. initially and sort of community work. Um, relating to that from 2013 onwards so um you know it was it was a sort of it was a it was a desire to go heavily into that sort of thing plus also what i was saying earlier about the the obvious need in the area mm. for that sort of support for organizations um so um yeah i've had a funny sort of um journey into that side of things obviously a lot of people that i work with over the career had done geography or planning and those sort of things i've never done any of that I didn't even do that <laughs> although in hindsight i think I probably should have done because <laughs> geography and that sort of thing is definitely where um where where I'm at and my daughter's doing geography at Liverpool at the moment. So I've oh, really? at least I'm talking things through with her having basically worked on those um, <laughs> that sort of subject area for the last twenty odd years. Wow, that's wonderful. And happy ten year anniversary because you started it in two thousand and thirteen. Yeah, I think yeah. March offic- officially will be the sort of wow. ten years. Um Are I don't you know gonna- what- yeah you should celebrate how celebrate, can you celebrate yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> i'm not working maybe for a bit i'm oh, uh, not responding to any emails <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> so what's yes. the what's the future where, where is cultural engine going have you got like a vision of where you want it to be i think i mean obviously covid gave us the opportunity to reflect a little bit on some of the areas of interest um, that we've been developing um, around um, the future of smaller communities, the role of, um, you know, the importance mm-hmm. of market towns, um, heritage to those places, thinking about the role of town and parish councils, the lo- local um, um, advocacy and leadership and projects. You know, we, we, we've we've done work before with the New Economics Foundation and people like, for example, and they engage with Centre for Local Economic Strategies and stuff in the past a little bit. And they've been interested on, you know, in, in these kind of sort of um, community wealth building ideas or, you know, stimulating um, sort of local economies, not just through big investment or the usual regeneration and economic development, top-down policy stuff, but how communities can really sort of make a difference and make their areas interesting and diverse and inclusive Absolutely. and everything else, um, you know, against or alongside or with, however you want to describe it, the trends around globalisation and um, the sort of the challenges around the high street, um, local distinctiveness, as people might call it, um, you know, appealing for tourists, that sort of thing. So there's something in that and there's something, um, and it's not unique to us, but I think what we've noticed is the role that heritage in particular can play in sort of wider what you might call civic engagement and advocacy. So when people get involved in heritage projects, they're obviously not getting involved just in heritage. They're getting involved in how people engage with their place, interpret it, how it's presented, the values they hold relating Mm. to it, who's included in that heritage, who's not, all those kind of sort of questions. And it's actually quite a complicated area when you think about it. And I know, again, that's not a unique insight, but it is quite an important one. And when you look at the role that parish and town councils, for example, play or other local groups in play, you know, obviously in rural areas, but not exclusively, you know, they, they, they tend to be very interested in heritage. There's no statutory reason why they have to be. They, they just, it just is, it draws people in. It's, it's what people care about. But, um, and so that link between the role that heritage can play and wider civic participation, um, I think is something we want to pursue more of, um, over, over the next few years. And, and, and we're obviously doing it in Rochford um, district. We're doing it in Uttlesford, as I said, and we'll we'll be looking and and, and working in other areas too around that. Um, and actually, again, when you think about it, there's a lot of capacity and and sort of I suppose funding in those systems too. That if they work better together, you know, around clear strategies or sort of partnerships with districts, with counties, with government, and everything else, that could be quite strong. And, there, and there's some sort of think tank policy sort of stuff out there relating to these sort of things as well, which is quite interesting. So we're, we're, we're sort of digesting a lot of that and trying to sort of piece it back together. The project we ran um, was funded by the lottery called, um, we call it Free Market Radicals. 
<laughs> for reasons I won't go into, but it but it was like about it. that that sort of um, and it got funding, and we were able to spend some time reflecting, working with communities on what they'd like to see, and it did turn out that heritage was definitely the biggest issue that people. Oh, really? that, drew, that drew people into thinking about their place. It was the one thing everybody was sort of pretty much universally sort of saying, yeah, we must do something more with our heritage. And that could be the natural heritage, that could be the Thames, that could be the River Roach, it could be wherever it is that people are, are, are focused as well as the built heritage and stories and everything else. And so the power of that is is critical. And obviously it, working on, on the Thames, for example, in relation to the projects um, that we ran with Thames Estuary Partnership, um, you know, the stories and the memories and the uh, and the sort of ingrained heritage and sort of um, understanding of s- a sense of place in Lee and places like it mm. drive the interest in doing broader, broader things, taking part um, as volunteers, um, setting up local groups, getting involved in sort of, you know, collecting local heritage and then re- realising that there's wider infrastructure issues and challenges that you have to face in order to keep places alive and relevant, you know, um, as well. So um, so heritage drives a lot of interest, I think. And that's, so that's one area we're definitely um, interested in exploring more of. I think this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about the North Thames Fisheries Local Action Group. I'd say what so. What a name. <laughs> that's such a name. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear more. So... Back in back when I was at Renaissance South End, um, two thousand sort of seven time, I was charged with writing the regeneration framework for the twenty years up to twenty twenty one. I thought I'll never be around South End or this area in twenty twenty one. That's that's <laughs> the way in the future. Um, <laughs> here I am, but um, and it was based on a lot of work from that we from some really experienced consultants looking at key issues and what what you know Thames uh, Thames Gallery funding should focus on in South End and everything else. There were three main areas that emerged, obviously the town centre, which is now obviously the city centre, um, and um, it's sort of um, offer for, for business, for visitors, for residents, everything else. Um, the airport was obviously growing significantly at the time, and there was a lot of um, stuff to do around um, getting that um, up, up and running as a sort of proper commercial airport and offer. And Shubin S, east of the east of the um, east of the boroughs, was also a priority. But there was some debate at the time around um, the port of Lee, old Lee, as people call it, and on sea um, and how important that might be to the you know the sense of place the tourism offer of south end it's, um there was limited understanding of the challenges it faced in terms of infrastructure and its industries and everything else and there was um also a sort of sort of prevailing sort of idea that lee was actually quite an affluent area in south end and didn't really need any investment mm-hmm. kind of missing the point which we didn't realize at the time that actually that's got nothing to do with it investing in in lee and the port would be good for the whole borough and the wider South Essex area probably in terms of its profile and everything else and its sort of direct employment. So that so that argument was lost and it went away and it didn't really resurface for some time. In 2015, through the Cultural Engine, obviously a good working relationship with South End um, Council, um, the government launched uh, the Coastal Communities Fund in recognition that coastal communities faced unique challenges um, and opportunities um, often focused around cultural and heritage. Um, and um, they set out guidance to say, well, you know, we want certain areas, and they pinpointed some. They pinpointed Shubiness and um, and Leon C in South End as two sort of distinct communities. We'd like to see groups form there, coastal community teams, they were called, um, and we'd like to see an economic plan, local economic plan, emerge uh, with local priorities that sort of can engage with local, regional, national policy, and maybe get some funding and all that sort of stuff. So the council came to us because we were well placed to lead that. We had a lot of the contacts already. So we um we formed the groups, um, talked to stakeholders about the issues around Lee, which at that point was broader than just old Lee. It was sort of up, up the hill, if you like, and uh, around the Broadway and the key sort of retail and hospitality areas. But in talking to everybody, even if they ran a, sh- a shop, not not in the old town, it was quite clear that the old town and the port, you know, was was the real issue, um, and that it, there hadn't really been any investment in infrastructure. Um, for over a hundred years, it seemed at least over a hundred years. Well, probably longer actually, right. in terms of formal proper investment. Wow. There was no, there was no authority, um, you know, to oversee it. It was just most land owned by South End Council. There was no sort of strategy for it, no sort of recognition of its difference in terms of local plan. There was some reference to it being a port and stuff, but there was no real policies to support significant investment in it, mm. and there was no real advocacy for it either, because you know. Fishers and and you know maritime sector organisations who operate from there anywhere else are individual businesses. At the end of the day, they don't necessarily have to represent each other in a place, although they often do. They often got a strong association with the area. 
Mm. So as part of it, we, we sort of looked at um, um, the importance of the fisheries identified with many of the um, people working down there in the maritime and, and the fishers themselves at what, what might be necessary around sort of access um, to the port um, because that was challenging and the channel that feeds the area was silting up. Um, infrastructure itself, electricity, all every, every issue you can imagine in a place that's heavily contested in 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 terms of sort of different uses, hospitality, there's also pubs there, restaurants, there's residential. Um, obviously, um, there's the maritime sectors themselves and operation areas for that, mm. um, and obviously lots of space for visitors too, and sort of hanging around as well for young people. So, you know, mm. it, it's um, it's a really interesting place, but it's kind of, kind of unique in the context of of, of North north essex on the thames and um kind of almost by chance really we we, we found we, we published that on the government website and anyone can view it on the coastal communities um website and we updated it in 2018 but in 2016 we realized that thames estuary partnership tech were looking at something around the future of the fisheries sectors in the north thames um and were Kind of, kind of making progress, but also kind of struggling to engage the key partners, including the including the council. Um, we had just published a document that basically justified significant investment, as far as we could see, it, in the port, um, and brought a lot of the partners together to talk about it for the first time in many years. Thames Estuary Partnership had its sort of fisheries fisheries group already, historic group that we run since two thousand and four, I think. You know, the fisheries liaison group, I think. And so we got together and we said, well, we could be your local partners and Thames Estuary Partnership, you could be the sort of strategic leaders and we can engage the council with you um, and other stakeholders and we can run it together. And we put a bid into the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, um, secured £600,000 sort of, as a sort of basic sort of amount in order to enable us to, uh, well, to enable us to address the historic lack of investment in um, port facilities and port sort of functioning, if you like. Of course, that wasn't going to pay for capital. That was revenue to support you know the running of of a team and um, we employed a fantastic animator called anna patel who, who worked with us in our office for three years being being the local sort of lead and um amy and myself sort of managed her amy amy Pryor from tep and myself on a daily basis she worked from our office in south end and slowly we um we were able to um fund studies that tackled the issues that had been talked about a long time and never resolved created a sort of feasibility study, a portfolio of feasibility studies, which a lot of people were quite resistant to doing because they said, well, we've had feasibility studies before and nothing's ever been resolved. And why are we wasting time spending more money on more feasibility work? We actually, we know what we need to do. We need to get on with it. But of course, that's never possible in sort of marine environments, protected environments, all that sort of stuff. Um, so um, we were able to get a lot of stuff over the line and do things like a, a spatial plan, getting the town council involved in sort of strategic thinking about the port for, for the first time since it's since it was established and uh, ultimately published lots of work. It closed in 2020, well, just before COVID. So um, we had a fair, bit, fair few things to sort of carry on with. And of course, uh, around that time, the government announced its levelling up strategy and funding programme. South End being a priority one area for levelling up and a fairly quick turnaround in terms of responses to projects, as is often the case, um, was looking around for things it could run with. The only real feasibility work on cap- major capital projects being done was through the North Thames flag, through the projects that, that Tep and us had, had overseen with the council often in the end. So it was a perfect timing. So we um, we worked with the council a little bit to and their consultants to put sort of a case together for funding. And ultimately, the council secured, I think, just over £15 million pounds to implement a lot of stuff that we had um, that we had worked on. And at the time, we had no idea. We used to saw, we used to say, of course, you know, when we look at this um, this feasibility stuff, you know, obviously we need a case ready to go, but we had no idea there was going to be an, an opportunity so quickly following on from the flag to, to make yeah. that. And, and, um, and so we sort, of, um, we sort of progressed with things in the absence of that. Um, you know, with the absence of really knowing what was coming and that happened and um, and it was perfect timing, really. And so, I mean, you know, it's still ongoing. They haven't actually delivered the infrastructure changes yet. We're talking about dredging the channel. We're talking about um, new, a new sort of a key wall, a, a, what's called Cockle Wharf, which has basically been made progressively over time, unofficially, you know, uh, but is the main industrial area in Lee, really important to... Uh, the fishery sector um, improvements to um, although this is outside levelling up improvements to electric 
to the electricity infrastructure with UK power networks, for example, a lot of stuff we looked at, and I learned a lot in the process about how a place is sort of made up structurally, particularly when it's so small and so so many different uses there. Um, they used to have a lot of outages in electricity, which is a terrible for the cockling industry, which needs to process cockles within a certain time frame according to sort of legislation. It can't be out. You know, they can't be facing outages in electricity. So yeah. lots of issues we're able to tackle. And um, so one thing led on to another, and um, that's where we are at the moment. And to the extent where now we're thinking about, well, what do we learn from that process? You know, But going back to what I was saying about heritage, the only way, not the only way, but a way um, to get people to buy into the idea of major infrastructure improvements to the port was to focus on the heritage and get people involved in the heritage project that reflected on the importance of the port over a thousand years um, of activity and showed people, I, I suppose, in the end, that if you didn't think about major infrastructure improvements to the area, that the port wouldn't remain active and its uniqueness is related to its, so its ongoing you know, it's it's an active port. Basically, it's got industry there. It's not a, a sort of museum like so many fishing villages and smaller ports are mm. in the country, and that makes it attractive. And although it's kind of messy because you've got chains and engines and processing going on down there, that's kind of if you lost all of that because the infrastructure wasn't able to support it anymore, right. then it wouldn't be an interesting place to visit. In the same way, it would be it would be looking back over history rather than looking at current day activities so that it, it's it, it's a living place the heritage is alive still and the people that work in the industry there are very committed to that and very personally sort of bound up with the history of the place of course and that influences decisions about where to work and you know that, that's important so we we ran heritage projects as well um sort of open days for artifacts and stories we wrote a book around personal histories and um, all, all histories we create an education pack we create a film which is uh, available to see online about um, the current challenges facing the port and some of the heritage around it. So tying in sort of heritage and a sense of place, and that, that's what really interested many people that weren't in the sector, in the oh. fisheries, maritime sectors, with those that were, who also understood all that, but were more focused on their sort of keeping their businesses going and everything else. Um, and so heritage was a sort of wraparound sort of thing that brought people together to realise they had to act. Um, so it's, it, it kind of works with our experience of working on heritage projects and we secured additional funding from the heritage fund for those projects was uh, was the sort of the thing that kind of I would argue made it work in a rounded sense in the end so that that's where we are but I think without the flag I, I just don't know what the future would have been you know because places that are affluent are not in the right areas for deprivation you know you know everything else they always struggle to get the investment they need Investing in this area was obviously um, something that, you know, I would argue is good for the brand of South End as a place. It's tourism profile. It has, I don't know how many exactly, but thousands and thousands of visitors in all year, particularly in the summer, but also through the year as a, a folk festival that is well known. Um, all sorts of other events, the regatta and everything else. It's got a great sense of place in it. You know, you, you, but it, but it's it's longevity as a as a host for industry for maritime sectors and its ongoing sort of role in that if you like as the last remaining port in the North Thames it is really important in keeping all that together and alive I think. Oh, absolutely. When can the public expect to see these renewal corners? When when is there like a is there a closed door to this project or is it or is there maybe perhaps there's not yet? Well. I think there's more work to do still around advocacy um, for the for the sectors, making sure the local groups that represent the industry are functioning well, um, connecting people better to the Thames, which is obviously an interesting thing for Thames Estuary Partnership. And I totally buy into that. It's 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 an amazing thing we have on our doorsteps. I live just down the road from me. I live in South Church and South End, so I see it every day. I've always lived along. I, I I grew up in Abingdon on Thames, and I, I lived in 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 South East London on the Thames, and I worked in Basildon on the Thames and South End on the Thames. I live in wow. South. End. I've always had an association. I can't really go any further now, otherwise I'd be in the North Sea. But it's um, <laughs> but the, but the, but there's something about it. Um, that I think um, you know, it means a lot to people, obviously in the area. So it's important yeah. to connect people to it and, and try and work more on that as much as possible. It's a very contested space, you know, lots of infrastructure out there, lots of um, lines, lots of um, sort of activity. Obviously, the dredging to, to serve London Gateway Port was obviously controversial and has, and has potentially sort of, um, you know, created issues there in terms of the way the environment is out there. Um, still ongoing um, analysis of that. So there's lots of, um, and so it's a natural space, but also a heavily sort of used and sort of, um, you know, industrial space, I suppose. Um, 
And so continue work on that. But in terms of the actual improvements to the area, you know, they're probably not the sort of things that are going to interest people very much. You know, judging the channel, you know, might be interesting (laughs) to some people. Um, (laughs) Making sure it flows properly, um, that boats can get out. Because, of course, tidal, you know, you've got a challenge um, because you can't get your boats in all all the time. And so the channel that feeds it um, has to work. It has to function. Otherwise, you can't get any boats in ever. So that's important. And then making good, if you like, or rebuilding or um, securing the key wall around Cockle Wharf. We'll, you know, people will see a difference there um, but because it was kind of built informally, literally with cockle shells and other stuff um, by the fishermen themselves over a number of years. Um, potentially unsustainable, unsustainable if you start dredging around it, it could collapse. So obviously you need, need, need to look at those sort of issues as well. Um, so there are a couple of things that people – would notice if they were into it. I suppose the opportunity now is to sort of start thinking more about sort of where it goes in terms of governance. You know, does it need some sort of its authority of its own? You know, like um, Whistable has its own authority, separate from Christchurch, um, sorry, from Canterbury um, Council, for example. And it's, it's able to manage its affairs to some extent and raise money and sort of, you know, think about its future in a strategic sense. That's not still not really possible at Lee. But the strategic plan we wrote, um, well, we commissioned um, with um, Allies Morrison's urban practitioners, people I've worked with before in South End, was the first shot study, and that's been sort of basically incorporated into the local plan in South End. Um, so there's a potential to sort of focus on the area more significantly. And then you've got the wider North Thames area and other communities around the, the Thames estuary, which obviously could benefit from, from projects, not necessarily of that kind, but where they connect more effectively with what's going out in in the Thames, you know, how they relate to it, um, how they advocate for it, how they get involved with it, how they, you know, sort of understand the environment and what's going on. Um, that That's an important thing. I think that's where probably if we do more work on it with the Thames History Partnership, that's probably where kind of it will be heading, you know, um, engaging with Crown Estates, engaging with developers, engaging with sort of local authorities that deal with those kind of things, the, the land-based versus, you know, um, butting up against the, the, the sort of sea-based or um, coastal-based planning issues, all that kind of stuff as well. So there's a lot to do. It's not the end, but we did um, hopefully make a significant difference at the time. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like a really colourful journey that you've gone through. That It's been incredibly insightful to listen to. So thank you very much for the story. Sorry. I was going to ask you, thank you, I was going to ask you, and you kind of touched on it, just wrapping up on your point there. It's just like, have you got a golden rule for people of the public of how they can, maybe not every day, but on an everyday scale, how can they engage in their blue space heritage? Like, have you got like a recipe that can fit into all these coastal communities or is it, is it just far more complicated than that? Probably. I mean, I don't, I've not got, I've, I'm not one of these people that have sort of um structures to work within or sort of particular sort of rigid rigid ways of doing work you know sort of um um, but what i do think um makes a difference is sort of listening to people um about what they care about and stories obviously stories are really powerful like you know absolutely you can think of national stories and issues that have you know um that governments and politicians use but it's like listening to people first about what they care about because when mm-hmm. i went in to do the coastal community in lee for example i didn't really know about the port much other than the little bit of delving we did years before at the south end and it took a long time to listen you know you can immediately mm-hmm. say well of course what we need to do is you know support the hospitality sector and maybe find some funds for for for, for the fishery sector or something obvious like that but actually it's it was far more complicated than that and uh, people came came across or came, you know, were in touch with the Thames in different ways, either as participants in terms of the industry or, or um, interpreting it from from an artistic point of view or from mm. um, reflecting its, um, you know, the environmental challenges around it through um, through creative projects, which we were aware of some of those, um, or through interpreting its history or through running businesses that relate to it directly or indirectly. And then you piece together where people want to, want to go with it and then you work out a structure to to make sure they've got a say um in relation to their area of interest and as i say in the end heritage often is is a sort of thing that tends to bind people together there's always a way in for someone somewhere in that probably not if literally everybody but that tends to be a thing that you can say okay well why are we doing this then you know what what does it mean to you what's your story with it and then how can you sort of 
bring people through that way rather than saying, well, this is how we do community development. This is how we do regeneration, the top-down stuff, which is why I was always put off by large regeneration projects because, I mean, I accept, you know, the infrastructure changes at least 50 million pounds is a relatively large project, but it came from a more grassroots perspective, working with industry, mm-hmm. working with people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the big impersonal stuff, the stuff that sort of, you know, built on green belt or, you know, sort of major developments, you know. I mean, I'm quite interested in the garden village movement and those kind of things looking at spaces from scratch on the whole you know it's the finer grain sort of people engaging with their existing spaces and how they um, understand and interrelate or relate to them um in different ways that's what's interesting and there's always ways of developing projects and programs and funding streams or just just setting up governance structures supporting people to set companies up whatever it happens to be get funding to help them do stuff you just have to listen um and, um, and listen to their stories and sometimes reinterpret it back to them through stories as well, through narrative um, and everything else. So um, that's, what we tend, that's what we tend to do and I hope it, hope it works. And um, but that's not a, it's not a standard formula, you know. Um, if we were to run a workshop, we wouldn't have a standard way of doing it. We'd mm. think about the particular context. It's probably harder work, but I think it's better in the end. Um, and we just use our experience over many years, um, hopefully, of to, um, to affect positive change with people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's obviously working, having this intimate conversation with your clients and then each story is different and that's what kind of is that unique selling point, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, everyone has a different perspective. There's no one, Yeah, no one's got the same, even if they politically say the same thing for whatever reasons, when you have detailed conversations with them, it's actually more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. That was such a great chat. It's been really interesting to have all these insights and hear your perspective on it and the projects you've worked on. It's um, great to talk about. I don't get a chance to talk much about stuff. Yeah, um, for, um, I'm really grateful. My head's down and focusing on doing things, but um, yeah, yeah really respectful on the difference we've made. So it's nice to have an opportunity to um, absolutely. There's probably things I could have mentioned, but um, essentially that's the sort of you know we really wanted to focus as much on that sort of Thames related project as possible, and I think mm. um, that was that was certainly something we've. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time doing working together with Thames Estuary Partnership Bond successfully and yeah. making some tangible difference, we hope. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, this is a great opportunity to reflect and you can plan out your celebration in March. Well, that's a good point. We hadn't really thought about that. So perhaps we'll, um, we'll have to do something. Yeah, yeah we'll have to do something definitely. definitely. I'll be there in spirit. I'll be cheersing on. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, people people from TEP should be there really I mean they've been a the relationship between culture engine and TEP has been a long one um and yeah. um you know um you know I was aware of TEP before um you know did you know from from years gone by working re- in regeneration in Basel and and um um in South End before we set the culture engine up you know you know it's been a, it's been a long relationship actually but it because probably formalized in 2016 17 and we hopefully carry on so it's been a good one yeah absolutely it's um you're an absolute treasured resource and we can't thank you enough <laughs> oh, thank you very much yeah and um <laughs> well likewise you've now reached the end of today's episode i hope you've enjoyed and if you'd like to get in touch you can find our socials on this episode show notes this episode has been brought to you by me chloe russell on behalf of the thames estuary partnership And I look forward to welcoming you next time.